know, we could see it. And in a community like this, in a segregated, deeply segregated community like Farmville, when you get about five or six years old, you begin to see, and maybe earlier, you begin to see who owns and controls the means of, of dist and distribution of goods and services in the community. All white faces behind a cash register, P giving you money, every time you're giving you money, you're giving to a white person. You know, these are the kinds of things that touch the psychic. Yeah, it didn't have to be said because, because you could always see the line. We went to black schools, white people went to white schools. We went to black church, white people went to white church. You know, if you had to go, we had small store, black stores in, in the black community, but to do your major shopping, you had to go to a white store. You know, mm -hmm. your parents worked for white people. You know, so, you know, you didn't have to say it. We grew up no knowing that we belong over here and they belong over there. In the black community, we were prepared by setting certain goals, objectives for ourselves. This was done primarily in the home, in the church, and in the school at that particular time because schools had a heavy reinforcement into our characters because they were black schools. Uh, schools were not integrated at that time. Uh, you know, do the best that you can with your life. You are unique. You have a contribution to make. You have something to offer. You have a talent. You have skills. Many, many other things that you do have. Go on out there into the world and get them. Don't stay here in Farmville. There's nothing here for you. Uh, you know, it's a retired person's town little small place of this nature, but go on and develop this college. If you can't go to college, take up a good skill. Skill trades were heavier then. Uh, we moved <clears> away <throat> from that, of course. Now, but in the 50s, skill trades were very heavy. Masonry, carpentry, electronics, auto mechanics, and many, many others. Mm -hmm. So we were encouraged, pardon? Then to your lack of employment, the young people had to yeah. go away from home. You know, every, every summer, right. most of the young people around here went to Atlantic City to work. There were uh, imaginary geographical boundaries in our minds as to how far we could go. There were imaginary psychological boundaries in our mind and emotional boundaries in our minds as to how far we could go, you know, relative to uh, the black-white situation. So we learned to work within the confines, to be creative as much as possible, to make, as, as black people say a lot of times, make do with what you have. And by this adaptability uh, to this own inner culture, you know, this is what brought, brought forth many of, the, th many of the, the, the qualities and the strengths. And it meant that we had to live beyond where we were. You know, we, we, we were not taught just to watch where you're walking right now, you know, just to look down right where you were in the 50s. But look ahead. There's something out there, you know. Go get it. We thought going north was the answer the answer that when you got north, you had made it. You know, just like the slaves did. When you got north, you had made it. But once we got north, when we moved north, we found out that wasn't true. I, Sammy had already, my husband had already been north, you know, and to live. But I found out when we moved north, moved north that it wasn't true. Because we, we moved to, into a white neighborhood, and I think the next week, the neighbors moved out, you know? So we encountered racism in the North just as we did in the South. It hurt, but we had, it, it brought about some self-pride too because in school we were taught, we, we, had, we had role models like I mentioned before. We had role models and our teachers, you know, instill uh, self-pride. And we just knew that someday, you know, we, it wasn't going to be like this all, all, all the time, that someday we were going to be somebody. So we just, you just kept that in your minds that one day we're going to leave Prince Edward. We're not going to be in farm the rest of our lives, you know. And for the most part, most of us did. You know, most of us left. Even if we came back, we left. But I think this made growing up a little better because we always looked, had that in the back of our minds that once we finish high school, we're going north. You know, everybody, I think most of black kids mm -hmm. in Prince Edward County had that in mind, you know. Did you think that going north was the answer? Did you think yeah, that, that, you life, thought it? that life was better <laughs> in, in, out there than yes, it was? Yes, yeah. you thought it, you know, but it wasn't true. Black teachers played an extremely significant role <clears throat> in the development of black children. Now, I'll tell you one of the reasons why, several reasons, but one that is most outstanding. Black teachers in this community, by and large, have known 
that they had a dual role to function when it comes to teaching our children. And that is, they taught the subject matter and the student. Now, it may, sound, it may sound contradictory, but it's, it is not. Because you can easily teach the subject matter, you know, uh, what is it, chemistry and so forth, balancing of equations and this, that, and the other, and learning the chemical compounds, so forth. But black teachers were very important to us because they taught us how to think and how not to think, how to think critically, analytically. This is where the teaching of the child or the student begins, you know, that you don't have to think just along this is what it did for me, that you don't have to think just along a certain given line that has been, say, tailored and laid out for you. But use your own creative thoughts. You have thoughts, you know, use your own creative thinking and whatever you desire to develop or whatever may you may and, unfold. Now you okay. may well, want to have something to do. When I came along, I, I felt that teachers weren't just concerned with academics. The black teachers weren't just concerned with academics. They were concerned with the whole child, mm -hmm. the total child. Uh, they were concerned with the fact that you were clean, if you were clean or not. They were concerned with the fact that uh, whether you had eaten breakfast, that was a big concern. And if you hadn't, you know, they would, they would, they would uh, purchase you a quarter with a pint of milk yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But they were just concerned with our whole being and they were concerned with uh, getting the, the most out of, out of a child. You had to do, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a thing that, you know, I do if I want to do. But our black teachers back then, they just, just they had their, their methods and their ways of bringing all of the beauty out of a child. They ma made you feel that you were somebody, you know. And, and when we were growing up, most of our teachers came, black teachers came from North Carolina. And we just, just looked up to them because they had so much to offer. And, you know, I still remember a lot of my black teachers and I just, I just use them as role models, especially one of my teachers, Ms. Kelly. I think she's dead now, but she was hard. She was really hard. I thought she was really hard, but she was fair. And she, she, I, I think she brought out the best in me. And I think I find myself imitating her in classrooms sometimes now. You know, she was beautiful. Give you an example of that. I visited the classroom once, <clears throat> elementary. I think it was, uh, well, kindergarten class. And when, when the students' names were called, they responded, good morning, you know, John Jones. Good morning, uh, Lily Williams. Good morning, Sam Williams. Good morning. Not present, not here. Now, this is teaching the pupil, you see, uh, teaching the child as well as the subject matter set aside, but teaching you just as Anne said, well, behavior, manners. Um, during the earlier years, Black teachers were extremely important to us in this area. I had a sixth grade teacher who was a minister. He had pastored in Crozet, Virginia. He wasn't pastoring then, but he was my sixth grade teacher. And every day, this is the first time that, we, that I was introduced, any of us were ever introduced to black history. Every day, every day, year round, he taught black history, and you may as well say all day. We had a little geography, and we had a little math, but he taught us so about when I first heard Sojourner Truth, I heard it from his mouth. Mm -hmm. Harold Tubman, uh, Benjamin Banneker, PBS Pinchback. The main thing about this was we thought, in a general sense, that he was lying because you know we had heard names of Mary Brown, you know Doris uh, Booker, or this, that, another, you know Sister Doe. But we had never heard of PBS Pinchback. Well, nobody's named that. Harold Tubman, you know, a name like that. Uh, Sojourner Truth, and then. You know, he lived right here in town, you know, right in this area. The college has recently uprooted his home to make a parking lot or something there, but the memory is still there with me, you know. And he gave that first great deepest impression in my life. Now, tell you what he did do once when I was in fourth grade, You're looking at the segregated system. We had a, had a superintendent here by the name of Thomas McElwain. He was superintendent of both Cumberland and Prince Edward counties at the same time. One day in assembly, one Friday, Mr. Jordan raised a question before the full assembly. Teachers, all the student body, what have, what have you. He said, who, lock, who, lock, who closed this door? Some door that, you know, double doors in the auditorium. He said, uh, 
and I wanted this door open. So one of the teachers responded, well, Mr. McLewain said he wanted that door closed. And then Mr. Jordan said, I don't care if Mr. Hacklewain said it. I want it open. And, then, and that was a very, very, I was in fourth grade then. Mrs. Flossie Folks, Flossie Womack Folks was my teacher. And that was the very first time that a prism of light broke into my soul. I said, oh yeah, it's something different to this thing. There's another side to this thing, you see. Because never had I heard anybody, see, Mr. McElwain was Mr. McElwain, you know. Uh, white superintendent of schools of both counties. And you know, he was Mr. McElwain, you know, next to Jesus. <laughs> and when they came, when he came, and other whites came to Robert Russell Moden Elementary School, Oh, how we used to just sing our hearts at God bless America. My country tis of thee, stars from All that, we just really, really, really went to work on that before them. But the turning point came, the turning point came when he said that, I don't care if Mr. Hackler went. So I knew right then, I said, it's another side to this thing. It told me, you see, this black teacher told me the system can be opposed, you know. It can be protested because I didn't know anybody could talk against a white person like that. I thought his rule was, was the rule. When I was in grade six, my sixth grade teacher was Arthur Jordan, a native of Farmville. Each day in class, he was a minister, but each day in class he would teach from his own thinking black history. Every day there were different characters in class highlighted, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Benjamin Banneker, PBS Pinchback, and scores of others, unwritten heroes of whom we had never heard. Robert Russell Moden from right here, lived out in Rice in, this, in the little pocket of uh, Prince Edward County, and he would tell us the true stories uh, regarding the accomplishments, the inventions, the discoveries of all these people there at that particular time was in our class two people, or there were two people, I should say, in our class whose father invented, right here in Farmville, whose father invented the switch in the railroad tracks for the gates to come down automatically. That man was from Farmville. And his, his daughter and his son was right there in our class. And Mr. Jordan highlighted that for us. But White stole his pattern, you know, but the fact remains, every day, every day in class, there were personalities highlighted. He, I recall him even telling us that when the war was, when the surrender uh, transpired in Appomattox, Lee and Grant came right across his backyard. You know, they fought all the way up, right, right through farm, you know, came right across his back. He's tell us things like this. And, every, and, th and this instilled within us a great, a, a tremendously great deal of dignity, and somebodyness, and he 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 he, he even get, he even cited a, a situation once here in Farmville when he was a boy, he witnessed a hanging of a black man, not a not a, not a full scale hanging, but he went in to uh, the courtroom and they said you can't come in. Well, somebody said the door is locked now. This boy is and he has to stay. Now there was an old black woman whom he said prayed, if you try to hang this boy, I'm going to tell God Almighty about you. And this black woman went over in the corner and got on her knees. And they tried to hang him, put their gallows around him, his neck, rope, and everything, and it broke. See? I never did forget that. I don't know who he was, you know. But, and at that time, it, you know, if, if it broke, he had to go free. You couldn't hang him. So he told us, and he named names, dates. He was a tremendous historian, photographic mind. Now, that was in grade six. But we moved on to grade seven, and it was in that school, once a week, same school, the principal, L.L. L. Hall, who was a very strict disciplinarian. He was my Boy Scout master, but he also, Hall also came into the class from one day per week. And he would sit on a desk, sit on the part that you write, and put his feet in the desk, turn, just take a chair every week, and turn it right around and open a book and began to read about black history, began to read about, he was the first one to tell us, for instance, uh, about Harriet Tubman and, the so and, and, 
and the Underground Railroad. Mr. Jordan mentioned Harry Tubman's name, but when they got to grade seven with Mr. Hall and opening up, opening up the book, you know, uh, explaining the Underground Railroad, explaining uh, the suffrage movement in Niagara, uh, uh, Seneca Falls and Niagara Falls, women's rights, you see. Now, this was the first time that we had seen, it stunned me particularly, I said, wait a minute, what Mr. Jordan said downstairs a year ago must be true because it's validated right here in a book. We had never seen anything written in print, published, about black people. Relative to white America, we were taught that a um, lot of the values, a lot of the values that, were, that came into being were set by middle class, let's say, white America. Uh, in a way, we were to emulate them, you know, because at this point, we were at the very threshold of integration. Uh, emulate them, uh, take on many of these as much as possible uh, middle class values and virtues. Um, that was a kind of, of, of inferior stigma placed on black people. You had to, you had, but you had to look through it to see exactly where, you know, the, the real truth behind it. That is uh, a stigma of inferiority. You know, you, you, you're not exactly where you should be, you know, but you need to do this, you need to do thus and so um, in, order to be, in order to be accepted in a white world, into a white culture, you see. Uh, there, there's diff they have their values, we have our values. But in a general sense, and the world was teaching this too, in a general sense, our values did not bear, they would tell us in general, as much weight as theirs. So let's try, what, what, does, this, what does this mean then? What do we say? Go to college, you know. Uh, excel in school while you're here and wherever you do go. Uh, appearance, reading, writing, many other things. And then, too, in, in this area, we were taught to stay in our place, you know, whatever that mm -hmm. meant, stay in your place, because our parents were afraid that we, if we stepped out of our place, we might get killed, we might get hurt, because they knew that because of racism here in, in, in Prince Edward County, you know, anything could happen to you. So they were fearful of the ch uh, for their children, you know, don't do this, don't do that. We couldn't, it was no place to go in, in the beginning, no place to go. And don't do this and don't do that. Be home a certain time and all these kinds of things. So we were really kept close here in Prince Edward County, you know, just almost excluded, really, mm -hmm. from, from other areas. We, you know, I don't recall growing up going to Richmond, even as far as Richmond, going to Richmond that often, you know. We were just kept right in this little pocket. Black students at Robert Russell Moton High School at that time began to compare our situation and contrast our situation with that of the white students here in town. We saw a lot of things that were distasteful to us. We saw, for instance, our having occupied a brick structure with three top paper shacks around it. Or even before that time, they weren't there. Then we looked over to the white high school. We saw one complete facility good scientific lab, academics were broader. We were talking to some white students. They had to take certain courses that were not, that were optional to us in the sciences and so forth. Then on the athletic field, their field was well lighted. We uh, didn't have lights on our football field or our athletic field. And I do recall when I played football in high school, when we had, to, had night games away, our coach would go there and get permission from them to, you know, let us practice one night so we could get accustomed to the lights. So there were some physical, these were the physical things and academic things. And we saw ourselves, begin to view ourselves as being somewhat inferior or subservient at that particular time as far as academics. The whole academic community, the whole educational community and setting was concerned because we did not have what they had. And we felt that our parents are hardworking, tax-paying citizens and people right here in, 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 in Farmville and in Prince Edward, hey, we need to have the, the same facilities that white students have. I thought integration was meant at that time, I thought integration meant as far as the schools are concerned that we were going to have better facilities, we were going to have equal rights 
whatever the white children had in their schools, we were going to have the same thing, things. I did not think that values would be destroyed and these kinds of things. I just thought it meant equal at that time. This was a mood that swept the age, really, because it was based upon economic and political and social denial, you know. And you've been denied, deprived economically, socially, politically. But now we're going to integrate this thing. And across the board, everybody will be what, what, what one has, the other one would have, you know. Uh, it's, it's one job, it's one job open to one, it'll open to somebody else, you know. And we you know we thought that it would just stop there. We did not envision a day of, hey, it's necessary to pass some legislation from Congress. We did not envision the day that, hey, it'd be a, a day of affirmative action. You know, go on and on and on to various things. And that these laws can be, if not kept intact, retracted, as we have seen with, you know, uh, conservative Supreme Court and so forth and other measures that have taken place in the, in the 70s and up throughout the 80s, 70s, 80s. So we had envisioned, you know, this is a day of integration and where everybody would be equal. You could go, particularly in public places. I do recall, and I was glad, we were the first two to integrate the bus terminal here when, in, in, well, when the uh, legislation was passed regarding uh, desegregation in public facilities. When the civil rights law was passed then, the two of us were running to the restaurant side over there, and there were blacks on the other side. We, we ate on the white side. The very next day that the legislation became effective, we ate on the white side. Well, there was some in the black terminal on, on, on the black side of the terminal. We, we beckoned to come on over. Well, they looked at us. They were <laughs> with suspicion and doubt us. What they were doing all that? But the white people behind the counter who were waiting on us didn't say anything because they knew, you know. And at that same time, this connects with something earlier, at the same time, um, throughout the South, uh, the, the, the command came down, or the demand came down. You got any black or white signs or over your entrance, paint over them. No colored entrance and no more white entrance. Well, they did it here in Farmville, but with one coat of paint. Mm -hmm. See, the word colored was up there, written in black, but it just paint one coat of, you know, paint just real lightly. And they did paint over it, but it, not so much that it was not yeah. invisible. They complied with the law. Yeah, right. Over. Yeah, they did paint over But they paint over it, <laughs> but we walked on in. The, the day after they painted over it, we walked right on in the other side <laughs> and ate. <laughs> Losing that black teacher relationship, I think, was one of the things that really hurt a lot because it was a bond between the student and, and, the, and the black teacher. You know, you, the teachers cared for you, you cared for them. And like I said, it was like being next to your parents. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, when you went to school, you knew that you were secure mm -hmm. until you mm -hmm. returned home that, that evening. You knew that with the principals and the teachers. You know, you had no doubt and, you, and the parents felt secure. You know, the parents had come to school, they were going directly to the teachers and whatever teachers said, they believed. Very true. Black teacher made a combination. He or she combined uh, academics with morals. Mm -hmm. okay? Not going to just teach the subject, but I'll, I'll teach the people also. So, you know, when you met him or her on Main Street after school, in, in a day after school, or on uh, Saturday, you know, first thing you start thinking, well, where am I dressed properly? You know, or how do I look? Or this, that, and the other, you know, because yes, here comes my teacher down the street, you know. And in, 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 in that day and time, they would, if, you'd be reprimanded the next day if you, if you, if you didn't look up to par. Mm -hmm. oh, they yeah. just showed they cared so much about you, you know. They just wanted you to learn and they just cared so much about your whole being. I feel that we, since we have integrated, we have become too comfortable. We think we don't have to do, that we're gonna make it anyhow. And I think that, that parents have, have um, allow the children to get away with too much as far as education is concerned, not being as strict as they would have been if uh, the schools had remained black because of the fact that you would have black teachers and those black teachers would be as strict, I feel, uh, on a black child. You know, you have to do, you must do, because if you want to succeed, this is what you have to do and blah, blah, blah. You know, not that, well, if you don't want to do, you don't have to do. <laughs> You know, uh, go on then. 
But with, with black teachers and black students in a black, all black environment, it, it is stressed that you have to do. You want to be like maybe Jesse Jackson. You want to be like Martin Luther King. You want to be like, like, like this person. You want to be like that person. But in the school systems, I feel that integration with the teachers, even, even the teachers, we are afraid to talk about black people. And, and then sometimes it's not just fear, it is the fact that we don't know about our own heritage. So therefore we cannot pass on what we don't know. So I feel that in this, this light, uh, our children are suffering. No longer than yesterday, we were talking about black history in class, and I explained to the children, I said, you don't know your heritage because, about your heritage because it's not written in, in, the, in the history books. We have a few people every now and then you see a black, a black face. But I said, I can ask any white child in here about their heritage, and they'll be able to tell me more than you. And I said, I'm standing here trying to teach you, so I want you to listen. I want you to learn about some of your people so that you can continue to pass this thing on down from one generation to the other. And this is the main thing I feel that, had, that bothers me. You know, if you don't know your heritage, then you don't know who you are. And it's just so much of our history, we do not know. You know, we have been denied and been deprived of, of that, these opportunities, but now, you know, if you can learn, learn all that you can about yourself, irregardless of what, kind of, what color you are. This is the way I feel about it. I have come from uh, the other side of the track, so to speak, South Street, South Street right here in Farmer. And I see myself, I see that I have grown. Well, let, let me back up and say that South Street is supposed to be one of the bad streets, you know, or the other side of town, the other side of the tracks. But with my parents and pastor and all who have helped mold my life, I see that I have grown. I feel that I have made a contribution. I went away and we moved away, we relocated, and I got an education, and I come back, and I think that I have given back to the community what they gave to me. Sometimes I feel more than what they gave to me. But I still feel that there is a lacking in my life. And I think it is the fact that I, I feel that I cannot reach our children or the students here. Maybe most teachers feel the same way. But I feel that until the parents assume the responsibility and the family come back together, we are go we're going to have a generation that is lost. The opportunities are going to be there, but they're not going to be prepared to accept whatever you know, is going to be offered to them. And I think that is really crucial. You know? And uh, maybe you can't see it unless you are a teacher to see the talents and the, uh, the potentials that are being wasted every day because of the fact that these children cannot see the importance of getting an education, a good education. You know, they, we still think that something is going to be given to us, but they're missing the boat. You have to get what you have to get while you're young and then you'll be prepared when you get older, you know. And whatever, when the door is open, then you can walk into it. You know, you can demand, you know, that this is mine and I'm, I'm going to take it because I've, I am prepared to take it. But I don't see that. I'm not saying all the students, but a large majority of them. And the parents got to take responsibility, assume that responsibility of getting those kids to study and said, this is your life, do something with it. Even if I didn't do anything with mine, do something with your life. And sit there and make sure that it is done. You know, not expecting the teachers to do, to do all we can do. I feel positive about the distance that I have come, or that, well, I, I'm sure I'll speak for Ann too, that, that we have come, considering uh, from whence we've come, that is, I don't see, see, it can be measured in different segments. Uh, I feel more, far more informed. I have grown far more intellectually 
and academically than I did, you know, before the move, you know, since I was my early days in, in, the, in, in the elementary school as they unfolded. Uh, but, I, you know, I do not see this kind of change as far as um, power. See, that has not come to black people yet. That is, and this is a crucial statement that I'm about to make, that is, you know, placing black people in key positions where they can make economic decisions that will affect their politics or political decisions that will affect their economics. You see, now we are not in that position yet. This has to do with who owns and controls, here again, the means and distribution of goods and services in our society. What black people own in this country, we spend about $110 billion a year or more, but what black people own in this country, you know, are just a drop in the ocean in compare. I mean, banks and businesses and everything else. You know, when you just, you know, you just see thousands upon thousands of whites on this, and but just not even two percent of blacks. And so, but see, that's a position that has not been granted yet, and we have not reached that point yet. This, this is that is that is the struggle that's underneath all of it. This thing is about money. This thing is about eco e economics, and white segregation says keep black people ghettoized, pump that dope in the community as much as possible, keep them ghettoized, stacked up on top of each other in apartments and projects and beside each other and so forth, keep them in that fashion and deny them as much as possible the rights of education. Or cut them off, you know, let them become a dropout in, you can become a dropout in first grade, you know. And so, so they won't excel because if they excel, they're gonna excel. That means excelling not only education but in money. And money constitutes power, you see. And so let's keep him away from that. And see, we have that hasn't really been unfolded yet. You see, we don't we don't own anything in Pan Am and and in, in the multinational corporations. You know, I'm just saying that any of the top insurance company, you know, people who sit on these boards and top boards of the banks and so forth, savings and loans and all of that, whatever they may be, whatever may come to them uh, soon, their their faces are white. You know, and we have not been see it's always been programmatic with us generally. I can see some changes, you know, but there has not been a change in that dollar yet of ownership. We, we, you know, we don't have that yet. And, and I think a lot of parents, you know, just instilled that blackness into their children during that time. I yeah. know with us, we were just so, so black. You yeah. know, everything was just so, so black, black power. You know, our children just knew it backwards and forth. And like uh, 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 in our home, every, what, Wednesday night? Friday. Every Friday, my husband gave our children an assignment. They had to learn something about Africa and report on it. And, and, and it, it, it paid off. It really did. It paid off, you know. And, and today they really appreciate it. You don't have, I mean, you don't have to go around wearing it on your collar, but it comes out and you know who you are. You're not, you, you're not ashamed of your identity and you know who you are, you know. So it, it really pays off to know who you are and yeah. express it whenever it's necessary, you know. Or just wear it proudly, you know. You know, wh whoever, whatever, whatever race you are, you know. That's the way I feel about it. <laughs> <laughs>